All life is for a human being is a seeking of finding meaning. We are utterly governed by our desire to find meaning, and this process starts not too long after we come out of the womb, and we keep doing this whole meaning-making thing as long as we are alive. I'm willing to bet you that in this present moment right now, you have different desires, interests, preferences, values, beliefs, and thought patterns than you did just two years ago. And then that was different than how you thought five years ago. And then I'm willing to bet that what you thought about 10 years ago and what was important to you in life back then was drastically different than now. And you're probably now an entirely different person than you were 10 years ago. So notice that the way you seek meaning changes throughout life. Not only the content of your mind changes, like your specific beliefs and values and preferences, but also the structure of your mind changes in how you view the world, how you synthesize information, your cognition, your morality, all that sorts of stuff. And I'm saying this because I've been studying a model of human ego development lately that actually models and maps how human meaning-making evolves. It describes the unfolding of human potential towards deeper understanding, wisdom, and effectiveness in the world. And this is very practical because it shows you the general way that your own psyche is going to develop as you go through your adult life if you continue to learn and improve yourself. And that part is key. You have to continue to learn and improve. You have to want to self-actualize and become your greatest version or else you'll just get locked in at a lower stage and your growth will stagnate and uh, you know a lot of problems will come from that. But I'm assuming you're here and you watch my content because you want to improve yourself. You want to become your best version. So without further ado, I'm going to share this entire model to you. So let's get into it. So the name of this model is the nine levels of increasing embrace in ego development, or just ego development theory, or EDT for short. This model was created by psychologist Suzanne Cook Greuter and you can read all about it in her 95-page research paper that I will link below in the description. But I first heard about this model through the YouTube channel Actualized.org, who went very in-depth on the model. I think the three videos he has on ego development theory has like totals like eight hours long or something. So with this video, I just wanted to make a roughly 30 to 40 minute video summarizing the model because I know it can be very boring to read a research paper or just not practical to watch eight hours of content. So with this video, you're going to get the very best nuggets of the model. A lot of what I say will be directly quoting the research paper. But of course, you know, since I'm only summarizing, I can't say everything here. And if you want to develop a deeper understanding of EDT, go read the research paper or go watch Actualize.org's three-part series on the model. So before I get into the nine stages, I just want to cover some general insights regarding this model. This model is a model of vertical growth, not horizontal growth. Vertical growth represents a leap in perspective, self-awareness, and wisdom. As movement up a stage represents a change in one's meaning-making paradigm and how they relate themselves to the world. It's a change in one's mental model of reality. And that mental modern governs how you think, how you organize information, and how you act in the world. Whereas horizontal growth is just the mere acquisition of new skills, information, and knowledge, and has nothing to do with a leap in perspective or in awareness. Movement up the stages largely depends on the individual's life circumstances and their openness to change. Movement will not occur as easily when survival is threatened. So the lower you are on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the lower you will likely will be in the nine stages of ego development. And if you're not open to change, you know, you get locked into a paradigm, you get comfortable, you get lazy, you stop trying to learn because you think you already know everything, and because of that you stop trying to improve yourself for whatever reason, then you'll get locked into a stage and you're not going to move up, and with that, life will become pretty boring and redundant for you. So overall, as you move up the stages, your worldview expands. You know, you start out in this world really only caring about yourself because that is all you know, and that's why children can be so selfish, because they only know themselves. They can't think about others in a significant capacity. But as you go through life, you realize it isn't just about you. There are other sentient beings in the world that are just like you, and then you realize, oh, I have my family. 
or my in my community to embrace and serve and then and then you take this development even further and then you realize oh i have my entire entire country to embrace and serve and then you take it even further than that and you realize oh i have the entire world to serve so the world you expands and expands so the stages will go from egocentric to sociocentric to world centric and so each stage represents a position of higher perspective and awareness therefore your level of development influences what you notice and can be aware of and what you can describe articulate cultivate influence and change it's also important to note that each stage transcends and includes the others so when you move up a stage it's not like you forget all about the previous one you still have it within you you've just kind of moved beyond that level of consciousness as your center of gravity but you still have it within you also remember that no one person is entirely at one stage they'll have different aspects of themselves in different stages. Personally, for myself, I see myself in about four or five different stages on this model. So the model is divided into the pre-conventional stages, the conventional stages, and the post-conventional stages. The first stage is the symbiotic stage, followed by the impulsive stage, followed by the opportunist stage, then comes the conformist stage, the expert stage, and the achiever stage. And then with the po final post-conventional stages, you have the pluralist stage, the strategist stage, and the ego wear stage. And then there's one final stage, which is beyond even the post-conventional stages, called the transcendent or unitive stage, which represents the pinnacle of human development. So without further ado, let's jump into these stages. I really hope you stick around until the end of this video, because it is in the later stages that you will receive the most valuable insights into how to improve your life and what you should be thinking about in order to become a more actualized human being. So let's get into this. The first, very first stage is the symbiotic stage. And there really is not much to say about this one because it's right where we are at when we come out of the womb as we have absolutely no sense of self and we're completely undifferentiated from our mother slash caregiver. This stage is not at all important to your development. I don't want to waste time on it, so let's get into the next stage, the impulsive stage. The impulsive stage is a stage where most young children are at, so one at this stage will cry or scream if their needs are not fulfilled right on demand, you know, like crying for mommy and stuff like that. So someone here is purely governed by impulses, as that's literally all they know. There's no sort of logic or rationality or any sort of abstract thought, so literally all they have to go off of is their impulse. And the level of thinking is so low that even when they get punished, they don't even really know the reason why. Their punishment just appears to them to be out of absolute randomness, and the individual at this stage can't even like realize that the punishment is related to their own individual behavior. Uh, there's pretty much no adults at this level of development unless they are severely mentally impaired. And again, this stage is not at all helpful to your development, so I don't really see much point in talking too much about it, but if you do want to know more about that, you can read the research paper. So let's move to the next stage, the opportunist stage. So the next one is the opportunist stage, and another name for the opportunist stage is the self-protective stage. And uh, actually, many of these uh, stages, they have multiple names to them if you read the research paper. I've just chosen to give you one label in order to make it less confusing. But um, anyways, so the opportunist stage is the first stage where someone can be somewhat autonomous, but they're still very underdeveloped. A stronger sense of self comes online. You start to realize that there are other people who have their own needs and wants, whereas previously in the impulsive stage, others were merely seen as means in order to, for the individual to get their own needs met. But the understanding of others is still very low for the opportunist reality is still seen as very confusing to them. The world is kind of seen as a jungle full of threats and predators. And because their worldview is so narrow and so egocentric still, their number one priority is to protect the fragile sense of self that they do have. Because that's all they know, that's all that's familiar, familiar to them. So they have the ability to relate to others in the sense that they can think, oh well, if he's bigger and stronger than me, then he is a threat and I should avoid him, but if he's smaller and weaker than me, well, then I could probably exploit him in order to get what I want. Someone at this stage can acknowledge and recognize rules, but they can't think deeply on why the rules are the way they are, and they just follow them to avoid punishment. When it comes to morality, to the opportunist, it can never be their fault. It is always the other's fault because they simply aren't aware enough to look inwards and introspect. They do not feel responsible for failure or trouble. They cause because they do not yet understand the connection between action and consequences, 
and this blaming of an outside source is simply just their way to protect their fragile self. They don't they literally don't even know any better. Most humans in the modern world will grow out of this stage by puberty time, but certain adults can definitely stay in this stage, particularly in more undeveloped areas of the world where survival is not easy to come by. But in the first world, most opportunists would be labeled as uncivilized or not yet socialized. So in sum, to sum up the opportunist, the sense of self comes online. One is able to differentiate themselves from others, but awareness is still very low. Survival is still basically the only concern for the self. They think anything that is good for my survival is good. Anything that is bad for my survival is bad. <laughs> They cannot introspect, nothing can ever be their fault, they always project the blame onto others as they simply are not developed enough to consider that they could be the problem. Sense of self is online, like I said, but it's very fragile. To admit they are at fault would break the sense of self, and the self is survival, so one with this, such a little level of awareness would never admit to themselves that they are the problem because that would be like dying to them and uh, no ego wants to die. So that was the opportunist stage. I wanted to keep it fairly brief because, you know, again, this, this level is really not all that important to your development. So I want to move on to the next one. And remember, if you do want to learn more about the impulses of an opportunist, you can read the research paper. Uh, it does have more info on the opportunist. Uh, so those th three stages were the pre-conventional stages. They are the lower stages of development that almost all adults will grow out of by the time they are fully grown. Uh, but these next three stages, the conventional stages, are the level that 80% of adults in the world are at. So you might be somewhere in here, so really listen up, because the insights you'll be receiving from here on out could uh, greatly give you guidance on where you should be looking in the future. So definitely listen up for this. So the fourth stage, which is the first stage of the conventional stages, is the conformist stage. When I was reading the research paper, I just thought that this conformist stage is just the epitome of what high school is for a lot of people and just being a teenager in general. You want to fit in. You want to be right. You want to feel accepted. So you will do what you must in order to do this. At this stage, one develops a perspective to think from the second person. So they begin to imagine themselves in the shoes of others. And that goes a long way in understanding the world and just developing morality in general. Overall, conformists will show a much higher trust in the world than opportunists. They'll be less closed off from everyone due to the deeper realization that they can actually fit in by just following the rules. So whereas the opportunist stage was very egocentric, in the conformist stage you begin to move beyond that and you kind of go group-centric. So, so the desire is strong to find your tribe, your group of people, and when you do find that group, you will conform. That's why it's called the conformist stage to whatever the norms and values are of that group. You make your identity that of the group's identity. So the sense of individuality still really isn't there. You don't yet have your own separate beliefs or values independent of the group. What you're concerned about as a conformist is just feeling safe and accepted. So of course you're going to conform to whatever group it is that gives you that sense of security and acceptance that the ego so strongly desires. And when you do find that group or groups, you know, my family, my tribe, my nation, my people, you put up a strong boundary between your in-group and the out-group. So anyone that does not identify with being as part of your group, you will view as an outsider. Weird, wrong, threatening even, crazy, deluded, or insane. Basically, it's a if you ain't with us, you against us mentality. Very strong boundaries, and I'm sure you can see how many of the world's problems arise from that exact type of thinking, saying that my people are better than your people. So it's difficult for someone who has invested their entire sense of self of belonging to certain groups with such rigid beliefs and values such as religious fundamentalists, people in cults, people clinging to certain political ideologies, to even fathom that there are people of other faiths whose beliefs are literally just as equally valid as theirs. And they can't even begin to think that what they believe could be wrong because to them their identification with that group or faith is literally the entire life, and to concede that would be like death to them. Conformists will try to uphold tradition and avoid rocking the boat. They aren't ready to make a stand to the group and express their true thoughts. Their expression will largely be limited to regurgitating the values, thoughts, and beliefs of the group. Thinking is very black and white, therefore the values of one's own group get interjected as strong shoulds, whereas anything against what the group believes in will likely be labeled as evil or crazy or insane. 
You can consider this stage to be very spiral dynamic stage blue-like if you're familiar with that model. But in sum, the conformist does not yet have a self in the sense of being a separate adult identity. Instead, he or she is purely defined by others. They are concerned with social acceptance and an attempt to adjust to group norms. They deeply care about others' opinions and evaluations. Therefore, conformists will put great value on appearance, status symbols, material possessions, reputation, and prestige because that helps them attain the acceptance that they so deeply crave. So the next stage is the expert stage, and this is where you start to develop a separate sense of self away from the conformist herd. So instead of completely identifying yourself with that of the herd, you're now thinking about what makes you unique, what attributes or traits you have, what talents you can cultivate in order to make yourself special and valuable. So this stage can come online in the later teenage years or in young adulthood, and this stage is just all about differentiation. Experts love to make sure that they are seen as different from their parents, siblings, and friends, and from others doing similar things. They feel good when they are getting respect and are noticed for things they can do. They also tend to assert their own needs and wants, which were suppressed at conformists for the sake of being accepted. Their old conformist identity may now even feel inauthentic or fake. And the center of gravity of today's society, at least here in America, is at expert, roughly. Finding your own voice and becoming your separate self-identity as an adult is the most widely supported and rewarded movement given its emphasis on individualism, whereas just a few decades ago, the center of gravity was at conformist. What's really important as the expert is the ability to take on the third-person perspective, and what this means is that you know, whereas the second, whereas the conformist could take on the second person perspective and imagine, you know, what's it, what it's like to be in the shoes of other people, you know, experts now have the ability to look at themselves and their own behavior in a completely new light. Therefore, the expert might start getting into self-help and trying to discover what types of behaviors can help them with their goals in life. But the main thing about the expert is that it's still about them. It's still in strong identification with ego. Although there is a capacity to think beyond the self, the expert really does and can get lost in trying to differentiate themselves that they fail to see the bigger picture at play. The group is still needed for the expert precisely because they, want, they have just moved away from the group and they want to feel special and valued, so they still need the group in order to experience that contrast. They still need the group in order to feel the, the love and acceptance that they so strongly desire. The wanting to be special can lead to feelings of superiority for the expert. Experts often feel like they have it all figured out. This is because they have just shed their flawed, inauthentic, fake identity from the conformist group and now they feel like they're the shit and feel like they know everything. Experts always think they know the truth, the best approach, or the right way of doing something and cannot significantly consider that their perspective is just one perspective within a sea of perspectives. They tend to evaluate others according to their own abilities and standards. Severe criticism of how one thinks is a common form of intellectual aggression at this stage. If I can do it, you can is a common message that shows the expert's lack of awareness that people differ and that their way might not work for everybody. Experts still think their way and their worldview is the absolute correct way and will ridicule and damn others in their mind as a result of this. They will intellectualize rationalize and explain away what doesn't fit their expectations or set beliefs. They are rarely lost for an answer or an explanation. Basically, they're very quick to fill in the void of not knowing because if they acted like they didn't know, then that would make them feel less special and less accepted and that's all the expert wants at the end of the day. They want to feel just like that, an expert. They must always know, they must always be useful, they must always do whatever they can in order to feel special and respected. The biggest fear for the expert is losing this sense of specialness. They fear being reabsorbed and getting drawn back into the conformist herd, into the mass of others. They also fear that if they should open themselves to other views, they might lose their current certainty and strong sense of self. This fear of incompleteness and vulnerability is often counteracted by showing a strong front and by not admitting any ignorance or vulnerabilities. And basically, the expert is still has a very strong ego fueled by the breakaway from the conformist herd, and now that what they're experiencing feels more authentic and genuine than what they were in the conformist herd, they think they have it all figured out, and, th and then they project that onto others. 
But the truth is, experts still cannot think meta very deeply and cannot deeply take on the perspective of others. But this way of thinking begins to be transcended as one moves into the sixth stage, which is the last out of the conventional stages, also called the achiever stage. So the achiever stage, also called the conscientious stage, is a stage of reintegration and embedding of oneself in a larger cultural context. This critical new dimension of the achiever's perspective involves a full awareness of linear time, along with the need for broader relational social context. The third person perspective allows individuals to look backwards and forwards in life. So with the expert, you know, the expert wanted to feel special, the expert wanted the results now, and now with the achiever, the achiever is thinking long term. The achiever develops the ability to deeply reflect on past experiences and choices in thinking and use that towards achieving the ideal future self. What should I be doing to set myself up and for success in 5, 10, 20 years down the road is something the achiever thinks about. In today's society, our educational systems are geared towards producing adults with the mental capacity and emotional self-reliance of the achiever. So that's basically being a rationally competent and independent adult. Achievers have acquired a sense of independence and self-authorship that makes them feel like they are the captain of their ships. For the most part, they are no longer as vulnerable to being accepted or excluded as conformists and experts are. Basically, achievers are much more free to do what they truly want in life based on their chosen values. You can say they are more in alignment with their true self. With this ability to become a captain of one's own ship and, you know, choose your own values in life and decide what is important to you, one is now able to notice contradictions and inconsistencies both within themselves and in the belief systems that they adhere to. They may see that the way a problem is framed is actually the problem itself. Typically at this stage one has transcended out of religious and ideological dogma to a degree, and it is common for one to believe that the scientific method will eventually allow us to discover everything there is to be discovered about the universe. And also with the achiever, the thinking may be much more big picture, and they can incorporate more into the worldview than an expert ever could. Adults at this stage are committed to work towards the betterment of humanity according to what they consider an ideal future. Whether they believe in democracy, communism, socialism, or whatever form of government or political ideology, they are convinced that their particular approach is best for all. And that is key to emphasize. They still think their way is the absolute correct way. They cannot yet truly fathom that there are people with earlier, more limited perspectives who have less choice and less capacity than they have. They don't really understand that an opportunist will exploit the system all the time if given half a chance, simply because the opportunist just doesn't know any better. They may get very frustrated with the single-minded egoic drive of the expert to perfect a narrow specialty without consideration of the bigger picture or an overall mandate of an organization. So just like all the conventional stages, achievers believe that if everyone was like them, the world would be a better place. So for the achiever, there still is not much systems or holistic thinking. They don't appreciate the beauty and the intelligence of the whole, and how all their parts have their place. They still see themselves as independent wholes, rather than interdependent parts of multiple overarching systems. So notice that, because it's a defining characteristic, that they can't yet truly grasp that they are just one perspective in a sea of perspectives and that all these perspectives are equally valid. They can't fathom they are just one human in a sea of humans. So the most important thing for someone at the achiever stage is achieving their goals and embodying their ideals. Their greatest fear is a loss of their control and their autonomy. They fear falling back into the conformist frame of mind with its dependency, submission, and blind obedience, and uncritical absorption of ideas. Therefore, one at this stage will make sure they are not pulled back, unconsciously consumed by somebody else's scheme. In sum, the achiever wants to feel like they are the driver of their life, the captain of their ship. With a greater capacity to think critically and introspect, they strive to live in accordance with their own self-chosen values and ideals. One who is able to reach the achiever mindset is often seen as well-educated, knowledgeable, confident, and successful because they feel firm in their identity. They feel like they really know who they are. It is the achiever that is often viewed in the modern world as the fully developed adult. However, you can actually go deeper than this and start getting into the post-conventional territory where only a small percentage of humanity resides. The major limitation of the conventional mindset is its acceptance of facts in the external world as real and its blindness to the acquired nature of their beliefs. They aren't yet aware of the ego and how deep the ego runs their life. 
So dealing with that is a major characteristic of the post-conventional stages. So without further ado, let's get into the first post-conventional stage, also known as the pluralist stage. So buckle up here because it is from here on out that the insights that you're going to get will catalyze your personal development and really change your life if you seek to understand and try to improve yourself to the higher stages. So the pluralist stage is where one starts to realize that the meaning of things depends on one's relative position in regard to them. That is, on one's personal perspective and interpretation of them. So they can now realize that based on the differing life circumstances of different people, people are going to have radically different worldviews. And that all of these worldviews are actually equally valid. This view of reality is called the systems view because it allows individuals to look and compare whole systems of thought or organizations with increasing distance. That is, they do not allow their ego to cloud their thinking as much and they can examine it from a more unbiased point of view. Post-conventional adults can become aware of their own unexamined beliefs. They have a strong interest in discovering one's underlying assumptions as well as those of society. They now realize that things are not necessarily what they seemed at earlier stages because the interpretation of reality is entirely dependent on the position of the observer. Ego development theory describes pluralists as being able to make, take the position of the fourth person perspective, which allows individuals to stand outside the system they grew up in and observe themselves and their cultural surroundings from a higher elevation. From there, one gets a better view of the whole system at play, and one can look at the familiar status quo through a whole new lens and are able to deconstruct all of its assumptions, values, and beliefs. The fourth person perspective also allows individuals to focus on epistemology, so they become interested in examining how they came to believe what they believe and how one knows and proves things, whereas before, at the conventional stages, everything was just taken as a given. At this stage of development, individuals realize that all groups and societies see it as their job to mold the minds and hearts of their members. Therefore, the pluralist can now perceive how much of their values and worldviews have been influenced by the environments into which they were born, in which they were raised, and in which they currently operate. Pluralists now realize that who we think we are depends on the historical context, geographic place, circumstances, education, and the overall structure of society, and many other factors as well. We have far less control over being molded than we previously understood. The pluralist realizes that we have been indoctrinated by school, family, religion, culture, society, etc., and now we realize our way is not at all the absolute correct way, and things would be very different for me if I was born into different circumstances. And also with the fourth person perspective, individuals realize that things are rarely ever what they seem they are. Everything is not so black and white. Rather than problems to solve, one must figure out what to define as the problem. And this whole way of thinking is very novel to the pluralist, so they don't really know what to do with it at first. They're able to deconstruct all of their beliefs, but then they don't know what to believe because everything is now seen as equally valid. But with this, the door opens for deeper forms of spirituality to emerge. The very things that I talk about here on my channel. Because at this stage, the need to reason and to explain everything by a rational means lessens. Linear intellectual logic gives way to a more holistic understanding of things, as one realizes that you do not necessarily need to prove something in order to embrace it. So rather than trying to analyze everything, pluralists want to enjoy their own subjective experience. What can be trusted is one's personal experience, sensations, thoughts, and feelings in the here and now. Experience itself becomes a new attraction. Therefore, things like meditation and contemplation and breathwork can become very intriguing to someone just entering the post-conventional realms. They can come to realize how feelings, thoughts, and body sensations affect each other. There is a new sense of body-mind connection and a beginning understanding of the interwoven, systemic nature of experience. Pluralists are often concerned with making a unique and personal contribution to the world independent of any socially approved roles or tasks. They might withdraw from external affairs and company life, or from ordinary daily routines. Instead, they turn inward in search of their own unique gifts, or answers to their own burning questions. But there's also a struggle within oneself. Different voices are competing for attention, and all seem to be very real and important parts of the self. Who am I? What is going on? How can anyone tell with certainty who they really are, as the identity is always changing and growing? Depression at this level has several facets. A the realistic fear of being reabsorbed, that is being sucked back into the rat race or of the achiever mindset by the demands of society, 
B, the dread of a routine work life that rarely allows for individual self-expression and creativity. C, the concern that one will never find a clear self-definition from which to consistently operate and generate a coherent self. And D, the deep experience of worry and tensions that come from growing beyond the conventional mindset, especially when it comes to intimate relationships. And this insight about the, the facets of depression for the pluralist just really hit home for me personally. Um, pretty much whenever I'm feeling sad and down, uh, it's pretty much always worrying about one of these reasons. So in that sense, I do identify with the pluralist in, in many ways. So to sum up the pluralist, they're the first stage that can begin to deconstruct their beliefs on a deep level and are able to cultivate systemic and holistic thinking. Their awareness of human diversity and multiple perspectives can be a powerful and progressive contribution when it comes to human affairs. And their principle is to live the way they truly want to live, doing what they love doing. They may be admired for their spontaneity, creativity, and unique self-expression, but conventional people may distrust them for being non-conformist and impossible to understand and predict. So that was the pluralist. I'm probably willing to bet you at least find some of yourself in there. But now let's move on to the strategist stage. So in the strategist stage, or also called the autonomous stage, one is able to take on an enlarged fourth person perspective, which places the individual's experience into the context of multiple worldviews and operating within one's whole lifetime. This way of thinking is beyond the pluralist in the sense that it is no longer only about finding meaning for the individual and living in accordance to one's own self-chosen values. One now realizes that they are part of unfolding history and that they have a duty in the role of this unfolding of history. Their system's view of reality becomes more deeply internalized, and they are able to compare and coordinate multiple complex systems. So this makes the strategist a very spiral dynamic, stage yellow-like, if you're familiar with that model. And this expanded fourth-person perspective is now truly world-centric. While earlier stages might express world-centric values and goals, strategists embrace the tenets of a global worldview and can embody them. They begin to cultivate the ability to live their entire life in alignment for the greater good. They have internalized systems thinking. They not only see the interconnected aspects of the external world, but also that of their own meaning making. With the expanded time frame and wider social networks, strategists can perceive systemic patterns or long-term trends and are often valued for that strategic capacity to vision. This is different from the pluralist because the pluralist valued all ideas equally and everything was seen as valid, so they didn't know what to think. But now the strategist realizes that, you know, the higher is better since not all arguments and positions are of equal quality. They realize that assessing, evaluating, and choosing are vital aspects of functioning and making sense of life. They distinguish between biased judging and wise discernment. Whereas one has to be on alert to avoid bias and notice one's evaluative preferences, judging itself is crucial in human affairs. So some of the very best books you can read about humanity society, systemic racism, oppression of certain people, economics, and how they relate to society were written by strategists. And if you read a book like that and you don't see any evidence of systemic, holistic, strategic thinking, then the odds are the book is probably pretty shit and you shouldn't read it. And when it comes to a strategist's internal world, one at this stage may notice different conflicting aspects in themselves at different times and in different contexts. However, unlike pluralists, who may despair about not knowing who they really are, are now capable of owning and integrating many disparate parts of themselves. This includes integrating previously compartmentalized sub-identities or marginalized parts of oneself. The shadow side of the self can be acknowledged to a greater degree, and therefore a new integration and wholeness is possible. Although people at this stage experience role conflicts and dilemmas strongly, they recognize that these are natural aspects of life. So basically, for the strategist, the self is becoming more harmonized and moving closer and closer towards unity, and divisions within the psyche are being healed. Strategists also are often motivated and infused with a grand purpose and a vision of what could be. But unlike pluralists, however, their enthusiasm is based on high ideals as well as on a more realistic view of what it takes to change one's old patterns in self, in organizations, and in society. They realize that they need to be the most they can in order to be at most of service to others. Both servant and steward leadership are part of one's care for the larger system and future generations. Because of their capacity for the long-term view, they often express a deep concern for the welfare of future generations. They feel a challenge and the obligation to make wise decisions that will serve beyond their own time and region. 
Wanting to help others evolve is one of the strongest motivators for someone at this stage as they conceive of developing people as a valuable contribution to the individuals themselves as well as to society. Humanists, developmental psychologists, life coaches, therapists, and consultants are often are at this stage. Strategists see themselves as being destined for tasks with a far-reaching impact different from ordinary people. They would prefer to enjoy their own passions on their own terms with maximal freedom and do so for the benefit of all. One's life work consists in trying to become the most one can become. In the strategist's eyes, good company, good questions, intimate relationships, and a meaningful occupation, as well as chances for self-actualization and self-fulfillment are essential for a meaningful existence. But it's important to recognize that the ego is far from transcendent at this stage of development. A serious effort towards even greater self-knowledge and self-management skills remains a facet of this person's ideal self-image and drive towards human perfection. The chief anxieties of the strategist is to not fulfill one's potential, not to self-actualize, and not to live up to or neglect their principles of justice, tolerance, etc. A strategist in wanting to be a transformer of society is often blind to one's own identification as being a transformer. And strategists can sometimes show impatience with others with slow development and frustration with their perceived resistance to grow. When someone at this stage seeks to become enlightened, they may make an enduring effort to achieve that goal, but they may not fully realize that their main problem is with accepting what is. So to sum up the strategist, one further cultivates systemic and holistic thinking, myth allows them to embody a truly world-centric worldview. Having a post-conventional mind is no longer novel to them as it was for pluralists, and they are committed to using their complex minds and unique abilities to serve as a vehicle of change for humanity, change that they hope will last far beyond their own lifetimes. But the ego is still far from transcended at this point, as they are strongly attached to the idea of being a transformer for society and being a self-actualized person. And anyone watching this who identifies with this stage, I'd just like to congratulate you because it is people like you who are truly bringing humanity towards higher love and higher consciousness. You're in the like top 2% of human beings on earth, and you truly are doing a service to help advance the human species. So that was the strategist. That was the second stage of the post-conventional stages. And now the last stage of the post-conventional stages is the ego-aware stage. So here at the ego-aware stage, people come to realize that all objects are human-made constructs, including even abstract constructs such as purpose, linear time, and even the ego. So basically, you realize that a water bottle is only a water bottle because your mind projects the idea of the water bottle being a water bottle onto the water bottle. <laughs> so like, okay, that's hard to understand, but it's saying that there's nothing inherent about the water bottle being a water bottle. It's only a water bottle because your ego assigns that meaning to it. And then you realize that that same mechanism of the mind that does that literally constructs your entire reality, literally. So you realize that the idea of me or the self is a bundle of concepts that the ego projects onto itself and that nothing about it is inherently real. We can describe this way of thinking as the fifth person perspective as one begins to deconstruct the nature of one's experience and everything that is experienced within consciousness. Everything about reality is questioned again. And unlike the more cognitively oriented people of lower stages, the fifth person perspective focuses more on the ego's clever and vigilant machinations at self-preservation by creating the illusion of a permanent self-identity. So basically this stage is the realization that the ego, aka the storyteller of your life, just completely and utterly constructs your entire reality. One at this stage realizes that the ego has functioned both as a central processing unit for all incoming stimuli and as a central point of reference for self-identity formation. So whereas people at earlier stages were beginning to recognize how their upbringing completely determined their experience of reality through beliefs, values, behavior, thought patterns, etc., people at the ego-aware stage now realize that the mind's operating program, the ego, is actually the one truly responsible for the experience of reality. However, at this stage, you are still not free of the ego completely. That will come in the final stage, the unitive stage. This sense of experiencing reality as groundless opens the door for one to experience the dark night of the soul, which is just the battle the ego fights between groundlessness and ground. With this insight, one may start to get a deep sense of what enlightenment actually entails. And when the ego becomes transparent to itself, it may very well desire ego transcendence. But the very attachment to transcendence creates the paradoxical situation of exacerbating the attachment. 
The more one tries to move beyond the ego with greater effort, the more one gets stuck. Noticing and experiencing existential dilemmas such as this is very common at the ego aware stage. And in dealing with these dilemmas, it is eventually realized that as long as one operates in the rational, language-mediated realm, there is no escape from this. Having an ego which craves clear boundaries and significance is now often felt as a constraint to further growth and understanding. The interconnectedness of all concepts is realized, good and evil, life and death, beauty and ugliness are now recognized as two sides of the same coin. They mutually necessitate and define each other. Ego-aware individuals start to pay even more attention to their own emotional and rational processing patterns. They observe other habits of mind such as the tendency to endlessly analyze and reflect in order to create ever more accurate theories of life and nature. All of these endeavors can now be understood as partial defenses against knowing the impermanence of the self. Thus, at the ego-aware stage, not just cultural conditioning is seen through, but the predicament of living in language itself. To watch oneself trying to make sense is intriguing and absorbing and can become all-consuming. Living at the edge of meaning and meaninglessness can be exhilarating at times and frustrating at others. But unlike those at the strategist stage, the ego-aware individual is okay with not knowing. They are content with mystery and can relish in it. People at the ego-aware stage may come to feel that the automatic judgment habit that constitutes much of ordinary functioning as a major barrier to deepen self-acceptance and embrace of others. As the process of self-awareness deepens and reasoning becomes further differentiated for individuals at the fifth-person perspective, access to intuition, bodily states, feelings, dreams, archetypal, and other transpersonal material increases. More than that, these sources of knowledge can become as important as rational deliberation for making sense of experience and for finding meaning in life. And most importantly, the door to enlightenment opens, as the more regular practice of turning inwards and observing one's own mental processes also often lead to the experiences of becoming directly conscious of pure being in which knower and known momentarily merge. Ego-aware individuals report more often than people at earlier stages that they are watching or witnessing the parades of thoughts and feelings come and go without trying to direct them. Thus, they experience moments of freedom from the ego's constant efforts at control and self-affirmation. Yet, at this stage, such experiences are short-lived. As soon as one evaluates and judges them, the magic is broken. With this, it is realized that the ego does not want to give up the mode of functioning it has become so familiar with, and it will naturally resist transcendence. The ego just isn't so quick to give up the illusion of our enduring separate identity which we had been defining, cultivating, and relying on for most of our conscious lives. Even if we understand that letting go of our attachment to the known will bring freedom from familiar kinds of suffering, attempts at doing so are ineffective and often lead to intractable paradoxes. The more one becomes attached to the idea of non-attachment, the more firmly one remains fettered. It is a fact of life at this stage that few people will understand them, given that so few people are ego-aware. It is possible for ego-aware people to express a sense of envy at how simple earlier stages of development were because of their own world being so complex. But given their ego maturity, most are capable of arriving at a dynamic and hopeful balance within these conflicts. They will go about fulfilling their perceived or chosen destiny independently and courageously in full realization of their aloneness. As leaders, they tend to build their own novel organizations or work alone doing what they perceive to be their best contribution to hum humanity. Some like to take on the roles of catalysts or transformers in organizations, but readily leave once they feel that their transformational work is done. As therapists and coaches, they can listen to others listening and meaning making and be with them in a deeply empathetic manner. They often offer transformational, non-distorted and creative feedback and practices to support their clients. They have access to their own earlier ways of meaning making in a much deeper and more effective way than people at the other post-conventional stages. This allows them to freely tailor their interactions to the needs of those they interact with. So to summarize, the ego-aware individual realizes that the ego, or the mind's operating program, completely constructs their entire reality. They realize that this mind operating program is just that, a program, and it's not actually the essence of who they are. But with this realization, they are still not yet free from ego. They live between ground and groundlessness, but probably mostly on ground. They begin to value direct experience more so than other stages because that is what is true. That is what is here right now. As anything that isn't here right now all belong to the contents of the ego mind. 
With this deeper understanding, ego-aware individuals now understand human nature at a much deeper level than any other previous stage, making them potentially effective coaches, teachers, and transformers of society. So that was the ego-aware stage, the last stage of the post-conventional stages. I personally see some of myself in that stage as I have ventured into the realms of groundlessness. But personally, if I'm being completely honest with myself, at this stage of my life, I would much rather stand on ground than be groundless. Therefore, I would say I identify more strongly with the strategist stage than the ego-aware stage. But I see parts of myself in all three of those post-conventional stages with just where I'm at right now. But there is one final stage, what ego development theory calls the unitive stage. Now, when I first read the research paper, my ego was like, all right, I got to get to the unitive stage as fast as possible because it is then that I reached the pinnacle of human development. <laughs> but thinking like that, it is not how you reach the unitive stage. To reach the unitive stage, you have to be groundless. You have to just be. And like I said, I don't personally feel ready to do that for a long time. And I definitely don't feel like I have exhausted the other lower stages yet. Like I haven't completely moved through them and I'm young. So I want to take the next two decades or so of my life to do that. And then after that, I can become groundless and experience the totality of human existence. So now the unitive stage basically just means the ego transcendent stage. The absolute truth is realized, but it cannot be grasped by rational means and by making an effort. It can only be experienced directly. Unitive individuals therefore seem to transcend narrow ego boundaries. They have open boundaries and are content with whatever enters awareness. Individuals at this level are now able to witness the whole song and dance of prior ways of understanding and meaning making with compassion and equanimity. They understand the need of the personal ego to ensure a sense of permanence and substantiality while at the same time recognizing the illusion of this desire for permanence. The previous way of viewing reality solely from the self's perspective and through the medium of language is transformed. This new paradigm has a universal or cosmic perspective as an organizing principle and is a steady place from which meaning is derived. So this literally means your worldview is beyond world-centric. It literally means your worldview is cosmocentric. You see your life as fulfilling the destiny of evolution, as it's all-encompassing, and it's basically getting in alignment with absolute infinity. So at this level of integration, adults can look at themselves and at other beings in terms of the passing of ages, of near and far in geographical, social, cultural, historical, and intellectual and developmental dimensions. They can take multiple points of view and shift focus effortlessly among many states of awareness. They feel embedded in nature. Birth and death, joy and pain are seen as natural occurrences. Consciousness or rational awareness is no longer perceived as a shackle, but as just another phenomenon that assumes foreground or background status depending on one's momentary attention. People at the unitive stage can see a world in a grain of sand, and they can perceive the concrete, limited, and temporal aspects of an entity simultaneously with both its eternal and symbolic meaning. And because of this unitive ability, they can cherish the humanness in the seemingly most undifferentiated things and feel at one with them. They respect the essence in others and therefore do not need them to be different than they are. So, and, that, and that skill, that seeing the oneness is something that I personally just really hope to cultivate as I go through life. Another important realization is that from a unitive point of view, later stages are not better than earlier ones because all are necessary parts of interconnected reality and the overall evolutionary process. Reality is now experienced as the creative ground of pure, infinite, unified consciousness. Reality is seen as eternally perfect. Everything has its place, everything serves its purpose, and nothing is actually wrong or right in the absolute sense because everything just is the way it is. From moment to moment, only the present is real. Radical openness releases individuals to be in tune with goodness, truth, and beauty and to relish them wherever they are present, which is absolutely everywhere. Unitive adults often act as catalysts in shaping others' lives. In being what they are without excuses, they challenge others' perspectives and demonstrate a way of being human that is different from the evaluative, conventional ideas about what it means to be an adult. In contrast to all other stages, unitive individuals seem to have intense, non-demanding relationships with people regardless of their development, age, gender, or any other identifications because they see the love in all manifestations of life, and others typically feel worthy and whole in their presence, no matter who or what they feel about themselves. For unitive people, inner conflicts and conflicting external demands simply are part of being and do not need to be resolved or denied, only witnessed. 
They are no longer driven by desires to be one way or another, to achieve one state or another. Instead, they can let go of the unattainable and simply bask in the pure experience of being. They are concerned with global justice, spontaneity, existence, and creativity, but create no undue tension around goal achievement. Rather than being passive, the non-attached impersonal stance allows for greater and more direct and powerful action where action is needed. Non-attachment to outcomes is an essential and liberating aspect of witnessing and acting out of non-defensive, spontaneous insight. Every theory is understood as a human construct, separating out, creating boundaries where there are none. The question for meaning and connection is an essential aspect of the human condition. Giving names to an experience and making distinctions is necessary for human growth, study, interaction, and communication, but at the ultimate source, there's absolutely nothing to distinguish among. The separation of self from others is experienced as an illusion, an invention to safeguard the ego's need for permanence and self-importance and to defend against its fear of death. Unitive adults have an integrated sense of a unique identity as participants in the evolution of the cosmos, and they are in tune with their life's work as a simultaneous expression of their unique selves and as part of one shared humanity. So to summarize, a unitive person can be thought of as a sage or a mystic or as a fully enlightened person. They've transcended the ego, they see no boundaries, they radiate love and acceptance, and they can relish in the present moment and just simply be. So that's it. That's the entirety of ego development theory. I personally find it very useful. So that's why I decided to share it. Because when I first read it, I saw how I went through each of the earlier stages earlier on in my life. And now I peg my center of gravity at being at the strategist stage. But I also see how I can develop further because I have had ego aware and unitive insights. And that's naturally the kind of direction that I will end up going because the problems that plague me now all have to do with the ego and how the ego compartmentalizes my life and holds me back from experiencing the oneness. So I see how in dealing with that, I would naturally move deeper and deeper into the ego aware and unitive stages. So yeah, I hope this was helpful to you. Remember, this was just a summary of the model. If you want to go deeper, you can read the research paper itself, which I will link down in the description below. You can also watch actualize.org's three-part series on the model. I can link those videos below as well. And so I hope you enjoyed this. Remember, don't skip stages. Don't try to go to the unit stage all of a sudden when you're only at Achiever or Pluralist. It just won't work. But hey, now that you have the roadmap to work your way through the stages, um, now you can know what to do. You can kind of make plans for what's next. You kind of peg yourself at a certain stage and be like, all right, you know, this is where I'm at. And uh, in the future, I can kind of do these things to hopefully uh, catalyze my development more because the more you develop, the, the higher quality human you are, the, the less division you're creating in the world and the more love and acceptance you're driving. And that is just what the world needs right now. So um, definitely take this model seriously. I personally think it's a great model, but just remember it is a model. So it's not exact, it's not perfect, but I do personally think it's a very good model. So I do think you should use it for your development. I think it can be very helpful. And that's it for this video, guys. If you wanna get a hold of me, follow me on Instagram and shoot me a DM. If you really enjoyed the content and wish to support at a deeper level and have a few extra dollars to shell out each month, I do have a Patreon that would go a long way in supporting the channel because I, I don't make much from this, and but I really do enjoy doing it. Also check out my website, thecuriousmindsofearth.com. All links will be in the description below. And as always, guys, have a great day and peace.